Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. On today's show, I have the founder of the American Franchise Academy, Aisha Biscaro. Aisha, how are you today? Hi, thank you, Frank. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure, Aisha. I, I'm thrilled that you're on, on, on the episode here today because uh, I typically talk with emerging founders, franchisors specifically. And in your case, we get a chance to kind of turn the tables here a little bit and talk about franchisees and how you really help support franchisors by helping improving the franchisee training and uh, kind of uh, filling that gap. So with that said, why don't you kind of share an overview of what uh, American Franchise Academy is? Yeah, absolutely. So we founded the Academy eight years ago. And it was really happened to be uh, something that was not planned. I was taking a, a small sabbatical from a very long career in the franchise industry. And I started to have franchisors where I used to work at and franchisees reaching out to me, asking me for support and questions because I have always been a teacher in my entire career. So I was always teaching and showing, you know, things to everyone and build really good relationships. And I noticed that the questions they were asking me were not about the brand, the brand systems, you know, the product, the service, the image, uh, or the marketing. They were asking me about how to manage the business side because I have a third of my career was focused on operations, direct P&L responsibility of, uh, of brand uh, units. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that there was a big need on that. I mean, I already knew that from my experience, but... I didn't realize how deep that the, the desire and the need for this information. And so I started helping franchisees. I became the accidental consultant, uh, <laughs> just ask, you know, supporting. And uh, little by little, one of them asked me, told me, hey, Aisha, I cannot ask you all the questions. Please write a book. And, and I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And I decided to do that. And after a little bit of work and finding a coach, I was able to write uh, my first book. And that really led little by little on really expanding and focusing on helping franchisees. So I went from a sabbatical to actually building the what today is the American Franchise Academy, where we focus on helping franchisees uh, grow and protect, you know, the American dream of business ownership through franchising and to go from a one unit job into mm -hmm. a multi unit enterprise successfully and profitably. Sweet. Well, you've had quite the illustrious career, 37 plus years of experience in the franchise industry. I understand you with Domino's for a long time and with Popeye's and Olive Garden. But I, I'd like to go way back. I understand at 21, you were involved, I guess you you starting your own boutique. And I love talking about experiences that don't work out, right? Because we learn from our failures, not from our successes. So would you, uh, let's start out when go back in time from when you were 21 starting this boutique. Yeah, absolutely. I actually had finished an associate's degree in fashion design and merchandising, and I thought I knew everything. And so I uh, took over this boutique that was importing textiles and, and products from Guatemala, which is where I'm originally from. And I thought I had it made and month one was interesting. Month two, I realized, okay, things are not going so well. Month three, I was, you know, the revenue was not enough to cover the expenses. Now I did not know the word revenue. I did not know the word expenses at the time. And uh, you just realized month to month that I was barely making it. By the year, I realized, actually before the year, I realized I needed to close before I got into serious debt. And so I closed uh, that boutique. You know, I've always been wanting to be an entrepreneur, clearly. And I, I was 21, about to be 22. And I decided, look, I'm going to take a little break because from everything I have done already, decided to get an easy job. And at that moment, a pizza delivery driver came in front of my, in front of where I was. And I thought, you know, what a great job. 
you get to deliver pizzas, you are listening to the radio in your car all the time. People is always people are always happy to see you. Perfect. Let's go and do that. Uh, in two days, I went and applied for a job, and two days later, I'm a pizza delivery driver for Domino's Pizza, and um, it was a temporary thing. I just didn't realize that um, I didn't know what franchising was, like most people outside our world, and uh, I was I just fell in love with the systems, the processes, the training materials. Literally, the profit and loss statement was taped to the wall of the manager's office. While I was a pizza delivery driver, the manager taught me a lot of things, and I learned why my business failed, you know, because I had no idea. It was just, it just became a temporary job that became a love affair for me, and I never left. I just made, you know, made that experience a career for me. Wow. What was the biggest lesson you learned at 21 when you decided to close the boutique? that you need to be humble enough to understand that you don't know everything and that you need to figure out, you know, that you need to really learn and understand numbers and business if you're going to be in business. I, you know, I really, I would have gone, I will go through it again because the lesson was pretty deep and actually it really informs what I do today. I know what it's like to know that you don't have enough money to pay the next rent you know, and, and, and looking left and right and being alone and not having anybody to talk to and, and to help you understand what happened. What did you do wrong? You were working every day, seven days a week, trying to make it happen. And, and it was still was not enough. So just really understanding that you need to know the numbers and, and then what are the actions that back those numbers? I think that was the, the biggest lesson that I got out of that. Mm -hmm. And look out of that pain became the opportunity of a lifetime. Because look, look what, it, what it's done for you, for your career. You owe everything to that failure, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would tell you that, uh, like I said, I would do it again. 100%. <laughs> I loved every single job i done since then. Being a pizza delivery driver is an amazing job. Uh, being an assistant manager, a manager, district manager, you know, being international. I mean, I just loved everything I've done. The industry has given me uh, an amazing career. The brands that I work for were just, you know, fantastic. I grew up in those in those uh, brands, and and uh, I've just had a really amazing life. Well, look, you 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 have an incredible amount of gratitude, and you found the good in everything. I can hear that from uh, you know from your voice and from from what you're saying, even down to you know being a delivery person. There was no shame in that. You're like, I learned from it. Look, at, that's amazing. Absolutely, I I actually have a, a video on my podcast that says uh, no job is beneath me. Absolutely. And I still have my, my pizza delivery jacket. I have my hat. I have my name tags. I every, yeah, every job. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think anytime as whether you're, you know, you're founder of a business or you're an employee, anytime you're, you're at that level where you say something is beneath you, you're already starting to crest and you're on your way down. This is where the challenge is. You're going to get smacked in the face by life. Absolutely. You know, and if you think anything is beneath you, you already have, and you're doing it, mm -hmm. then that already is, is just taking your joy away. You totally. know, totally. Yeah. I'm yeah, not about sure. taking my joy away. I, I think that everything we're live, you know, it, I think, uh, as long as I think that as long as you do things well, you should mm -hmm. be proud of whatever you're doing. That's beautiful. So tell me about how you kind of rose up in the ranks then of Domino's. Yeah, you know, it's funny because when I was a pizza delivery driver, I, I was trying to figure out, you know, what was going to be next, you know, in my career. And that's, you know, realized, look, I, I saw assistant managers became GMs, GMs, uh, GMs moving out and making more money. And then I found out I was with Domino's. I was in a corporate store. Uh, that was another thing that, oh, okay. that happened. And I saw that I learned how I, in that brand to be able to become a franchisee, you needed to be a GM for a year, whether it was for corporate or for a franchisee that will certify you so then i thought you know what you know i always had that entrepreneur spirit i said i want to be a domino's pizza franchisee and my thought was i was going to take it to guatemala there was no domino's back then in guatemala and so i said that's what i was going to do but i knew i had to be a manager so i couldn't even inquire so so i said okay i got into assistant manager and manager and in the middle of my year, somebody took the franchise for Guatemala. And so that was it, the end of my career. So I finished still the year and uh, somebody said, hey, Aisha, you speak Spanish, you have a passport, you travel. My dad's a pilot. And why don't you apply for international? 
And I said, you know, that sounds interesting. You know, I'm still very young, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. And uh, I applied for a job in international. And literally six weeks later, I'm in Seville, Spain, opened the first Domino's in Spain. And that started my career in international with the brand. I opened the first in store in Spain, the first store in Dominican Republic, the first store in Argentina. And, uh, and then you just helped master franchisees for the, for the brand uh, around the world. Um, I lived in 14 countries doing that. And I learned literally how to start a franchise store because that's what they become in the country from scratch many times over. And, uh, and then supported those franchisors for the next uh, three or five years. Uh, eventually, I actually decided to stop traveling and I was in charge of Central America and the Caribbean. And I asked my franchisees, hey guys, I'm gonna, I'm looking for a job at the headquarters, but if any of you wanna hire me, let me know. And I would, the people, I had three offers. I took the one in the Bahamas and I was running the franchise for the franchisee for Dominus and Dairy Queen in the Bahamas. Loved it, three years, did well, rogue records. They end up selling it for, for a very top price, actually the highest per unit price uh, in the history of the brand. And I left that company at that point and went to the headquarters. I was uh, invited by the COO to work for him in the headquarters. And I did that for four years. It was an amazing job. I represented operations uh, in all cross-functional teams. I don't know if you heard that, you know how Domino's is a technology company? Yep. When I was there, that's when it was starting. Uh, that's when they Brandon started with the technology, and I was there, part of the ops team, supporting you know uh, all the decisions uh, for the IT department. And I did that for four years. And they wanted, they asked me, "Hey, what do you want to do?" Once the CEO that I work for left, I said, "I want to keep growing." And they said, "Well, you got to run operations." They said, "Well, I run a country," and they well, it got to be bigger. So I came to Atlanta, where I live now, and I took over the Southeast Atlanta uh, region for the company mm -hmm. store. So it was all company stores. I ran over 60 units in three states for three years. Did great. And, uh, and then I decided to move to supply chain. I got an invitation by the chief supply chain officer to learn how to run a large distribution center because Domino's does their own. And I train on that and I did that for a little while. I ran one for um, St. Louis and I realized it was really boring. Supply chain is very boring. <laughs> and I was a few months short of 20 years with the brand. And I decided, you know what, should I venture into the world and see what's out there or should I become a lifer? Because really, once you hit 20 years in a brand, you know, it's going to be very hard for you to leave. And so I decided to leave. And that's when I went to Popeye's. The first year I ran company operations um, and I helped them divest the stores. This, this new CEO wanted to be franchise store focused. And so we sold the company stores. I moved to up services the next two years and I ran um, uh, strategic projects there. And the last two years, they convinced me to go into international. Oh. So I was now overseeing the entire international ops and training division and helping supporting 26 countries around the world for the brand. And uh, then I was recruited by Darden Restaurants. I didn't want to keep trying. I was gone a week or two at a time. Uh, can you imagine, Frank, right? And I have kids. I'm married. I did have a life <laughs> at that point. And so I, I took the job with Darden Restaurants, amazing organization. They're not a franchise, but it is an amazing organization. I was doing uh, overseeing uh, operations for Olive Garden for Georgia and Alabama. And I did that for about a year until I was recruited to run a small brand called Pretzel Maker. And uh, so I, that was actually my last uh, corporate job. I did that for a little while. And at that point, my kids were going into high school and I decided to take a sabbatical and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Because really, I still have that entrepreneurial spirit. I just did sure. not know, should I become a franchisee? Should I create my own brand? You know, what do I do? In the middle of sabbatical, helping and guiding my kids into high school is when I started getting the calls from these franchisees. And I found my new passion and what I've been doing now for eight years. Wow. And what a great foundation that you had for 37 years that led us to now the American Franchise Academy, right? In 2016. Yes, yes. So that was about 29 years. And then the last, uh, the last eight has been okay. uh, with the Academy. Mm -hmm. okay. So, all right, give me the, I'd like to hear this defining moment of when you decided to start American Franchise Academy. You know, and I, I will go back to Philip, the franchisee that asked me to write the book because, you know, people don't ask people to uh, write a book on a subject that they don't really desperately want knowledge on. And, and, uh, and he was someone that, 
you know, like most, not most, but many typical franchisees, right? He is a insurance agent, professional, award-winning, successful office that invested his savings and and uh, and money into a franchise business mm -hmm. that he thought was going to be his retirement plan uh, away from doing insurance every day. But uh, lo and behold, he realized that it was not that easy, you know, and he was in food service and he didn't understand how to manage these, you know, 20 year olds and how, why would they not show up in time? And, you know, why is my food cost off and what do I do about it? And why is the labor off so off? And what do I need to take, you know, take care? I mean, it was just, and then I realized that a lot of the franchises I have, I have been working with in the brands have been top performing franchises. The ones that joined the the advisory boards and the one that, you know, are part of the strategic thinking is they're all top performing franchisees. So mm -hmm. I've seen, that's what I've most seen. But then then he reached out to me and through him, he, you know, talked to, you know, talked to somebody else and talked to somebody else and more and more questions. And, and they were so grateful to what I was able to share with them that for me just came so natural. And then I realized, you know what, this is a way that I can do something that I love, which is teach and share best practices. I can do my own business of so be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. create something from scratch and have my own brand and and get a team of people, which I love being a leader and, and, and lead people and, and help people grow. So that's when I decided to do this. And uh, and I never looked back. So you shared with me before before we started recording the episode that essentially you have three different programs, right? So uh, share, share with the audience what those programs are and how they support franchisees at different levels. Right. So I'm one of those uh, rare uh, service providers in the franchise industry that we are 100% focused on franchisee success. We're franchisee advocates, but franchisor supporters, because without the franchisors, franchisees would not have the opportunity of their American dream of business ownership because... You need to have very unique, special, diverse skills to be a successful creator of a brand. And so the fact that franchisors have done through that um, is amazing. And so the problem is that many franchisees do not come with the business acumen that they need to turn that revenue that comes from the proven brand into profit. And so, so what we have is we created three programs. The first one we started, it was the first one we started eight years ago, which is supporting franchisees, not just on turning a business profitable, but growing into a multi-unit enterprise. So it's literally a year long program where we will give them the business acumen to manage the business and scale it with success and confidence. All the systems and processes to hire and retain and inspire great people. All of the systems and processes to control your uh, your controllable cost and maximize your profitability. All the systems to increase revenue year over year. We teach our franchisees that they need to own their sales. The brand will only bring so much revenue, but what you do in your community will, will then determine whether you're going to be able to increase that revenue year over year and sure. you need to have the skills in the tactics and the strategy to do that and then we also teach them all the systems to how to scale because managing one unit is not the same as having multi-unit organization the moment that you go to two stores it's already you know a, a different business a right. different model and uh and so we teach them all of that the systems processes procedures policies and help them document it into a management manual to give to the managers and train the managers so that they can, every time they open a unit, you give them the ops manual for the brand and the management manual for the managers. And then you go to the next unit, ops manual for the brand, management manual for the manuals. Ops brings you revenue, management brings you the profit. And now you can scale you know, with success. Uh, so that's what we do for franchisees. And it's a year long program. It's a mastermind too, by the way. So three times a month, we get together with all of our franchisees and have amazing discussions above and beyond everything else that we do. But then the second program came about by our customer's request. Our clients were going multi-unit, they were expanding, and they were hiring the district managers as we guide them to. And uh, they said, okay, Aisha, what does the district manager do? What is their job? What do they do every day? I'm like, oh, I guess you guys don't know. And looking in the marketplace, there is no, you know, structure training, college-like professional program for district managers. Not and that so I'm aware of. No, that doesn't exist. And so we created that. We have a 10-week program, a very professional, robust um, program on teaching the district managers what is their role, 
the seven critical responsibilities and the routines that they need to follow every day, every week, every month to be able to be successful and have a quality of life too. Because that's the challenge. A lot of the district managers that don't have this guidance, uh, they're overcome by overworking and sure. then burn out. This is really, it's just really sad. And so we have now changed that. Uh, we launched that three years ago and uh, we had trained over 270 district managers by now. And uh, it's been amazing. Now, uh, several of our franchisees use that program as part of the career path training for their leaders. And it's amazing. So we launched that three years ago. And then as soon as we launched that, it's funny, then my clients and franchise clients were saying, hey, um, what about managers? Can you do something for managers? As you know, And they really wanted leadership and management skills because the brand provides amazing resources for how to duplicate the brand, right? right. How do you do the product? How do you do the service? How do you take care of the building? How, you know, if it's in food service, food safety, but not so much on leadership and management. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? Interesting. And uh, discussed it with our mastermind franchisees and they say, yeah, and... And so I created a, a, a um, curriculum, but it was so wide because this teaching these managers how to be business managers, right? Sure. Uh, so actually, one of my clients said, I, I, when I said it's too much, and of course, the price would be too high. And so they say, I should split it in two. So then what we do is we have unit management basics and unit management advanced. The first one is four weeks, second one is five weeks. So you can take it in different quarters and it gives also the manager the time to implement what they're learning. And we launched the basics last year mm -hmm. and trained over a hundred managers already. And uh, we're launching the advanced in the fall. And when they do that, they get certifi certified on unit management. And so that's what we do. A hundred percent support franchisees on their business. Many of them don't know what to train or even how to train. So they trust us now to do that for them and their team. And we're we're not everything for them, but we definitely are some a, a resource to give their team knowledge that uh, that they need to be able to be successful on their behalf. Yeah, well, you definitely filled a gap in the marketplace. If you think about it, one of the big challenges for emerging franchises specifically is, first of all, they don't you don't even know what you don't know, and. I'm going to, I'm going to speak firsthand. Like this was my own experience. When I first franchised my brand, I was so focused on training the franchisees on operationally how to run the business, the not brand. so much yeah, on how to run the brand, not on how to be a business owner. We had the big aha moment, like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. In our case, and I think this is really, really common in a lot of emerging franchise systems where a lot of times the, the mom and pop, the single unit franchise owners, this is their first experience owning a business. And exactly. as a founder of the franchise, I had assumed that going into this, that maybe I was going to have people that were a little more sophisticated and they were familiar with running a business. And I found myself having to backtrack like, oh my gosh, forget about training on the brand. We got to teach these people like basics on how to run a business. Our business changed forever once we figured that out. But, oh, my gosh, you think about all the emerging brands. You know, you have so many things are being thrown at you, right, when you first start in franchising. And you don't even know what you don't know. You're worried about, you know, legal and regulatory. And you're worrying about making sure you're taking care of your own staff. And you're training franchisees on the brand and trying to get them up and running. The last thing you think about is, oh, my gosh, these people don't even know how to run a business. And... Um, they, don't, they don't know how to do a schedule. They don't know how to do don't. inventory. They don't know how to read a perfect law statement, how to calculate break even. Yep. Yeah. And that's when everything changes for an emerging founder. But I think that's, that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why emerging franchises specifically run into a big problem and they, they either, they kind of dry up. They, they don't hit their goals. They never become the brand that they had envisioned or they just, they're not able to, you know, achieve necessary milestones to be able to stay open. And maybe that's part of the reason why franchisors run into trouble and, and close. Yeah. And the, and, and the problem was not the brand to begin with. It right. was the franchisees that were selected to, to run them and not having the business acumen to run them profitably. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to blame the franchisees. I do blame the founders, the franchisors, myself included, because we just don't know. And, but when you do have that, that self-awareness, and you really tap into your franchisees and seeing where the gap is, where they're not understanding, you have to pivot and you have to make that a 
highest priority and it's wonderful but you know, know there's a challenge right now frank you know that? it's called joint employer that right. franchisors you know can only go so far when it comes to well there's two challenges and this is what i share with franchisees because i it's not like i blame franchisees i say they need to take responsibility for the knowledge that they need sure. that they did not buy when they buy a brand right and so there are two this is what i would share with our clients and really in all of the every time i speak you know i I, I do public speaking and, and workshops and things. I told franchisees, there's two reasons why franchisors do not give you, you know, this business degree. Number, uh -huh. you know, number one is lack of, actually three reasons. Number one is lack of resources. The franchisors are working really hard to create and support a proven successful brand, right? And so if they're going to give you a business degree in management, number two, they're going to have to have additional resources and they have to charge you a heck of a lot more than a 30 grand franchise fee. Which they don't have because, the resources. Exactly. Which it. costs money. And the right. number two is joint employer. Joint employer prevents today yeah. and worse more every every year from touching anything that has to do with the people and the leadership. And and so with that, you know, because of, of the liability. And so they are not able to do it even if they wanted to. And so that's where we come in, you know, to help out. Oh my gosh. Okay. I should, that's, that's the big aha moment for me then, because as the, as the franchisor, there's so many, there's so many things, there's so many skills that I want my franchisees to have, but I'm limited. But by having my franchisees go through the American Franchise Academy, they're able to get those skills and able to learn how be able to train the trainer without me being involved. Exactly. And you know that what we're giving them is my 37 year career in the industry, my love of systems, process and procedures, and our programs are no fluff. We have, we have the no fluff zone, <laughs> all tactical, practical templates, tools, forms, everything that you need, everything that we teach you, we give you the process, we give you the template, we give you the, like everything. What's... So do you have a hundred percent clarity? And then as a franchisee, you're part of our mastermind that meets three times a month where we have a discussion with a lot of other multi-unit franchisees or merge or starting to grow franchisees and go deep into the subjects in a, in a total open and safe zone. It, it just changes, it changes their lives, you know? Wow. Uh, what's the, what's the cost of the tuition of the, um, the district manager training? Yeah. So the, the franchise program, the command program is 1100 a month, which is uh, 13, two for the whole year. Okay. Includes everything. The district manager is 2,900 uh, for the program for each student. And, and that's the unit 10 weeks, manage, that one? Okay. 10 weeks, that's a 10-week yeah. program. Okay. And the unit manager basics, which is a four-week program, is 850. And the advance is 950 for a five-week program that includes everything, workbooks, teachers, live classes, homework, assignments, final exam, graduation, everything. That's, and it's super, taught, that's yeah. super reasonable. Yeah, yeah, we've done it very accessible for anyone that needs this information. And the district manager program and the unit manager classes are taught four times a year. Every quarter, there's a new cohort because it's a right. cohort based, and they're live instructor calls, by the way. So, so um, the franchise program, we only accept three franchisees per month. Okay, uh, is this um, strictly done online through live webinars, or do you have a classroom? classroom we, well? We've been using Zooms before since before Zoom was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, COVID hit, and all of a sudden everybody's using our you know uh, yeah. you know our, our process. But no, it's all virtual. We know people can't travel. Managers can't be going someplace, right? Uh, we sure. try to make it as as accessible as possible, and we have implemented a methodology that not only are there online recorded lessons, but we have live instructor calls with the participants with Q and A's and discussions, kind of like the way college became sure. after COVID or during COVID. We, we're doing the, that methodology since before COVID and there's assignments. So there is homework to be done to implement what you're learning. There's a final exam they had to pass. And we actually do have a graduation, a virtual graduation where we invite the uh, the direct reports or franchisees to celebrate the students are graduating because it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it, it takes work to be able to get certified with our programs. Nice. All right. Well, look, Aisha, as, as a franchise expert, I'd like to kind of turn, turn this interview or turn this podcast into, um, towards emerging franchise or specifically. And, uh, since you've seen good, bad, and ugly, since you have your students coming in representing those brands, can you show, in your opinion, what are some of the key factors 
that contribute to an emerging franchise brand success? Yeah, absolutely. You know, obviously it starts with selecting the right franchisee. Sure. And and because of our existence, it doesn't have to be someone that already has that business acumen, but it's someone that understands that this is not going to be for the most part an absentee business. Like you have to be part of the business and you have to understand and not understand, get the knowledge to understand the numbers and you know and what it takes to be able to be successful. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, that ops manual and training materials and job aids, all the resources and structures that you can give uh, your franchisees for them to be able to implement and train the brand to new people, especially with turnover. Depending on what industry you're in, turnover could be anywhere between 50% and 150%. Franchisees and their leaders need the tools to be able to train the new people coming in as, as efficiently as possible so that they don't have the waste of labor that takes whenever you have to have you know new people bring people in. Another one is be able to provide franchisees with the clarity of the financial model. So, you know, sometimes franchise, franchisors, you know, especially in the uh, item 19, they say, oh, yeah, so here's the average P&L. Uh, but what does it mean? We, you know, if you get this labor cost, how do you get to that labor cost? Like, what's the positions and how many and when do you bring more people? You know, that level of specificity, because every model is different. How sure. you, you know, uh, um, staff a pizza store versus, you know, uh, a gym is different. And so that I think bringing clarity of model so that they know what they're implementing and following up. And so uh, the, the franchisors, the emerging franchisors that are more successful, and we have a lot of clients from a lot of those brands, mm -hmm. um, the more that they have taken the time and giving those resources to their franchisees, uh, the better that they, they do, you know, sure. and then, um, I think that that's probably one of the things. If you're in food service, please give your your franchisees uh, the ability to know what the ideal cost of goods is for the business. Absolutely. There's so many brands that are in food service that do not provide that, really? uh, Frank, and we're doing it for them, you know? Wow. And so, yeah, so you that's know, what I, I would say. And I think about uh, on the emerging franchise side specifically, how franchisors that don't ask for the financials from their franchisees, you, you've got to know how they're measuring up to their fellow franchisees in the network so you can help grow their margins. If, we're Absolutely. Not, if you're not asking for the financials, you're just, you know, you, you're throwing, uh, you're throwing darts, you know, at a wall, hoping that they, uh, that they hit it right. And that's no way yeah. to run a business. Not only, not only asking for the financials, but then sharing the aggregates. Yes. Right? Doing sharing something with back. it. Yeah, they're sharing that back because I do know there are several emerging brands that do ask for it, but the franchises don't hear back at all. They don't know anything. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, if you are not collecting your P&Ls, start collecting them and let the franchises know that they're going to get the aggregate so that they have a prototype to compare their financial numbers against. Mm -hmm. And I, I promise you that most franchises will be happy to do that as long as you actually share back so that they have a a model to compare where they're at and that way they can work on the things that they see that they're different. Yeah. You know, franchisees love that, by the way, to get those numbers. Sure. And it will be beneficial for the franchisor because uh, otherwise, how does a franchisor make a decision based on, you know, for unit for favorable unit economics if you don't have that information? Sure. When I was starting out, my attorney had said, this is in, kind of with, in tongue in cheek, that don't even bother collecting the financials from your franchisees if you're not going to do anything with it. Because you're just Absolutely. frustrating with people. And even kind of taking it a step further, where uh, another huge development for, in my experience, was sharing their peer numbers in like a network scorecard. And I was the one in my company that was, I was kind of holding back a little bit. I was afraid that the franchisees towards the bottom were going to, you know, be embarrassed and obviously not have their name and numbers be out there for the entire network to see. But the, my team convinced me, no, this is the right thing to do. And having a complete network scorecard and having all the franchisees share all of the numbers and actually the transparency of that. Number one, the bottom franchisees had hope because they saw what other franchisees in the network were doing. And now suddenly they saw what was truly possible. So that was, First of all, that was a, um, a blessing in disguise. And secondly, 
if somebody was towards the bottom of the network scorecard and they were known as a complainer, um, the other franchisees really didn't take their complaints, you know, uh, to heart so much. They didn't have as they didn't have the clout that they had until their numbers were shown. So it, it, all in all, it was the right thing to do. But I think number one, the biggest learning lesson is collect the financials and do something with it. Don't just collect it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it does, it gives so much to the franchisees. It gives them a roadmap, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge, important best practice. Talking more about the emerging franchisor specifically, you know, that statistic that 84% of all brands never get to hundred units. I know there's many reasons why, but what's in your opinion, what do you think Aisha? Why do you think, uh, uh 84% don't get to hundred units? Yeah. You know, a great question. You know, sometimes, uh, Franchisees, you know, our clients come to us when they're starting to think about, you know, going multi-brand. And one of my first questions that I have for them, okay, you want to do that for financial reasons or ego reasons? You know, because the answer will be different. I mean, it's True. fine if it's ego, you know, but just know that you're going to make less money. And uh, if it's financial, then then let's really talk about the numbers because this might not be the right time. And so I think for franchisors, People that, you know, the emerging ones, the ones that are starting, you know, is, are you doing these based on ego or are you doing these based on money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because sometimes we, our ego takes over and doesn't allow us to make the right financial decisions. And when you are an emerging franchisor, you absolutely need to really look at your financial side 10 times more than your ego side, right? E right. Okay, you want to grow and you want to expand, great. But literally, you know, I, there's a certain number of units and every, depending on what, you know, what model you have and what industry you're in, the number might be different, right? True. So, you know, that, uh, what do you call it? Royalty sustainability is different. I mean, they, they say it's 100, but it could be 75. It could be sure. 50, whatever number it is. You need to get to that number as quickly as possible, as efficient as possible, and you need to be doing it as profitable as possible with a very systematic approach. And if you don't have that discipline, that's what's going to have you not get there. You know, um, I know a franchisor that was expanding and they were based out of uh, out of Michigan mm -hmm. and they opened one unit in Atlanta. One. Whoa. That franchisee failed because the cost of the of the product itself was 30% more than it cost the franchisees, you know, in Michigan. So the the unit economics did not work. Sure. So here we are growing and expanding because somebody decided to ask for a unit and now that brand suffered because of the closure, right? And so you really had to be very careful as to how you're doing it. And for a franchise, so I don't think there's an option. You have to do it very strategic and, and numbers minded so that you can actually do it effectively. So I think that's really key when it comes to emerging franchise. Or if you have a brand that is proven mm -hmm. that the model in the right place has shown that is profitable and does the, the unit economics work, then expand that way, you know? I, I, I've worked in brands, global brands that, I mean, we, even, even when we had thousands of units, we still had two or three markets we worked on and focused on when we came to development. We did not just do 50 states, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and so why would somebody that only has seven units be looking at five states? You know, it just, it makes no sense. So sure. no number sense. So I think that that's one of the, the, the biggest challenges. If you prove in a brand, then there are other reasons why you're failing. Yeah. And these founders uh, now more so than ever are looking to private equity as the savior. Yes. And they're losing so much of what they work for. Right. Yeah. And, uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the, on the influx of private equity being involved in brands really early, earlier and earlier now, in some cases from the, from the, you know, inception of the brand. What have you seen? You know, it's a couple of things. I mean, obviously, you know, I get it that the access to, to cash is good, but if you are needing that access to cash, it's because you have not really taken the decisions that you needed financially to grow and expand your business. You know, I think yes. that is proven. How did McDonald's grow? How did Domino's grow? How did Wendy's grow? I mean, they didn't have private equity. You right. know, they just grew. I mean, and Tom Monaghan was there until 1999. I grew up with the man running, you know, Domino's. And mm -hmm. and uh, he was, he grew through franchising, but he was smart. He was carefully. He was financially sound. So you can do it that way. So if your need 
the private equity money there that for me that's already like a, a you know a, a red flag in my mind mm -hmm. or maybe it is that you want to go as fast as you can so you can and you're willing to give up part of your business then if it's a, an open eye choice okay got it P personally i just like you know control and uh and so i'd rather go slow and and, and careful than to give up part of what i work for so hard to create you know that's what i you know that's that's my that's my my comments on that i would say yeah. you know and um i mean access to cash sometimes it could be more expensive than you get it somewhere else so i mean it's not for everyone but some people might decide it's good for them you know and if it's good for them because their goals are different then that's great you know but i will tell you something else though and this is something because i have experienced brands where that have gone you know a public or been bought by other people and something gets lost when it comes to the culture of the organization when an outsider comes in whether it takes over or now is influencing decisions and the entire organization feels it okay and so if you are going to bring private equity you're going to have to fight to be able to get that culture that you created that made the brand what it what it is you know what it became right because uh the brand is not all about the product and the service they provide, but it's also the spirit that comes behind it from the founder that really cares and loves about what they do every day. And they really cares and loves about their people and what the decisions that are being made. And so not that private equity doesn't care, but you know, they're more focused on the money side and the people side and the sure. culture side. And you do lose something behind it. And I've seen it many times, too many times where that happens. And so it can still be it can still be maintained, but then both whoever is taking over or is joining the organization needs to be committed to keep the culture going, and that's what's going to be part of the strength of the brand. I will tell you that Domino's would not be who Domino's is today if they had not been able to very successfully keep the spirit of what Tom Monahan created in the first place. Yeah. You you're not going to go to a Domino's pizza company meeting and not hear the cheer. The cheer that I grew up with when I was 21 years old. I know it to this day. I tell, <laughs> you know, and and you see it on, if you follow any Dominoid franchisees and you are in their feed, you will see them in meetings doing the cheer. And that's part of who we were and why the company has now reached over 20,000 units around the world, right? And that is really very important. So that's what I would say about private equity. Okay. I, I hope the founders that are up and coming, merging, that have bootstrapped that I, I hope they uh, they heed, I don't want to say your warning, but I, I hope that they strongly consider what you just said, because I, I do agree with you 100% on that, but it's not for everybody. So I, I know that's kind of a loaded question, but you believe in even in today's market with as competitive as it is that a bootstrap founder can compete with a private equity concept uh, in the same sector. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it happens all the time. I still know a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of franchisors that, you know, are, you know, founders that are running the organization and doing, you know, quite well, for sure. And and w there's so much more access to capital now without having to give part of your business away mm -hmm. that we just need to find the ways, you know, to do that. And I mean, there is something to be said about going slow and strong, right? Sure. And so absolutely, I think it is. And again, again, it's based on what are your goals? I, you know, franchisees ask me all the time, Aisha, when do I bring my first district manager? And the answer is always, it depends. You know, the question, the first question is, do you have the cash flow? And the answer is, yes, I do. Okay. And then the second question is, how much is your freedom worth? You know, mm. what, how much is a freedom worth? And then I say it was worth a lot. Okay. So are you willing to give up, you know, $70,000 to a district manager to get your freedom, your freedom. And for some people it's like, no way, Jose, I want to keep that money. I said, okay, sure. congratulations, Mr. District manager. <laughs> and for other people say, oh, absolutely. I'm willing to give that money away for my freedom. Great. Let's find your district manager then and let's train them. And so um, the answer is yes. For some people, maybe the, going the uh, private equity way is the right way because they want to be able to have that, you know, that cash and and be able to go faster so, so that eventually they can completely buy, you know, sell out. And for some people, they just are loving the process and they're willing to go slower. And and there's something to be said about that, too. So I think it's absolutely possible. Yeah. Well, By the way, I'm grown already eight years and it's all bootstrapped. One of the other dreams that 
founders have is to grow internationally. And how could I not ask you about international expansion? So that's been your wheelhouse. What should franchisors strongly consider before expanding internationally? All right. So great question. Oh, wow. That could be a whole podcast. I know. I, I know. <laughs> we're 45 minutes in already and we're going to yes, go. And talk yes, yes. But so, it is uh, so important though. Well, first of all, do you own your brand in those countries? What do you, I've been what do you mean with, by that? What, what, what do you mean? Legally, you need to be oh, able to trademark. have your name, your trademarks. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise, if you go to another country and somebody else owns your trademark, yes. you are not going to be your company. You're going to have to change the name and the value that you create in the United States and of people that travel to the United States will be completely gone. Yes. Uh, I've known big, big brands that have closed countries because they had a trademark issue, were not able to solve it and had to exit the market. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, uh, yes. And more than at one time. And so, first of all, do you own your your trademark in that country? (laughs) Number two is being tried and tried again. Brands cannot own units in another country. You do not understand Guatemala, Salvador, Canada, England. You do not. I promise you, you do not. Don't do it. You do need to find, and they try to give area agreements many times. Does not work either. Rarely. you. The, the model has worked over and over is one master franchisor per country. Mm-hmm. And they own, the, they own the rights for that country. And yep. then there are two ways. Either they are fr- master franchisors, meaning that they have the rights to sell sub-franchises, or they're going to develop the whole country. That's the model that has worked the best, but you have to really check on whoever those people are. Because once they have your brand, they own it. And even if you want to take it back, the other countries are not like litigation in the U.S. Just because you own it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to take it back. Sometimes they might just keep it, you know? Mm, wow. And so you need to really be very, very careful about who that master franchisor is because you are literally married to them. And the amount of influence that you need to have with them to be able to protect your brand is tremendous. I know of a brand that, you know, there was this particular country that grew so much that they really had all the power. And we really tried to have them abide by our product standards. And eventually we had to kind of bend to their desires because we have no power at that point. And so it is very, very helpful. So my suggestion is don't even look at international when you have not fully developed this country. Um, There's too many rules and precedents and economy situation is, you know, if you really, really want to think about that, you might want to really research before you do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Uh, I on that. What I did was I had a vision to grow internationally and I thought it was money well spent to at least go ahead and trademark in all the countries. So the 28 countries in the European union and uh, Australia and Canada, of course, and some others that I had uh, at least got the trademark approved. The second mm-hmm. reason why I think it's, a, it's money well spent for a franchise or is you don't know when you might be exiting. And before you grow internationally, it sure leaves some meat on the bone for the buyer of your brand when they see that the brand already has trademarks in 33 countries, for example. Oh, 100%. That was very smart. Yes. Thanks. Well, (laughs) you know, in a funny story in Australia, our trademark i9 sports got rejected because there was a company called iSport. And so we had to be I-9 Athletics. Now we haven't, I-9 never expanded uh, overseas, but it's I-9 Athletics. Coincidentally, in Australia, this company named iSport filed their trademark in the United States. iSport, and it got approved. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. But lesson to be learned, though, if you're a founder that is thinking has the vision to potentially go internationally, go ahead and get the trademark if you can afford to do it. It's, it's money well spent. Yeah, absolutely. It does add for the, to the value of the brand when you go to sell, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it could be a long process too. You don't know how long it's going to take. It could be it's long and costly, for sure. Yeah. But it is worth it, especially if you do it in the countries that you know that brand particular has the strength to go grow into. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so how can franchisors adapt their business model then 
for the different cultures and economic environments? Is that just straight up, we're going to master franchise this, like you said, to one person that's going, or one group of people that are going to own the brand in that country? Where is that fine line between selling the brand rights internationally and me, the founder of the organization and of the overall brand, having some sort of involvement in maintaining the brand? Oh, no, you absolutely, I mean, you don't sell the brand. You sell just the, the rights to duplicate the brand, just like sure. a franchise. Same same, same thing. Uh, and that needs to be 100% clear that you own the brand. They need to follow all of your standards. The, the A little bit of a difference in international is that as a franchisor, you need to be clear on what are the core products or services that you want every single one of your units to provide. You know, because... Because obviously you do need to tropicalize, we call it in, you know, in, in international. Sure. You do need to tropicalize, but you at, at the same time need to protect the integrity of what the brand is. So, you know, so if you go to, you know, going to McDonald's, right? If you go to McDonald's in New York, Texas, Florida, Brazil, or England, you know, the Big Mac is the Big Mac is the Big Mac. Right. Core product, that's never going to change. Your customers can always go into any McDonald's anywhere and find the Big Mac. Mm -hmm. except for India <laughs> uh, uh, because they're vegetarian, right? Right. And so that's the thing. So first of all, you need to know what is the core products and you need to protect and defend those like a tiger. Right. Right. And then anything that is going to be tropicalized, right? You you might even have very clear standards of how much you're going to drop it. Let's say, you know, 5%, 10%. What is your limit? And then you need to protect that to your core and to have a, um, it's called an exception process or um, an exception process application so that the franchisee in those countries has to apply for that exception process uh, to be able to be approved. And they have the certain things I had to submit, you know, uh, to be able to do all of that. And right. then you approve it. Like you have to have the right to approve anything that is going to be, you know, tropicalized, they say, right? Uh, and so, and you got to protect that. You, you have to do whatever you have to do to do that. And you need to be firm and non exceptions because the moment you start doing, you know, uh, de de uh, departing from what you said is a standard mm -hmm. countries find out, you know, there are conferences to <laughs> talk to each other, you, you, you know, and, um, and so you need to not do that. Oh yeah. That was within the 5%. Oh yeah. That was with, you know, if you can right. explain it, then, you know, it's solid firm people, franchisees in international need to know what your limits are and respect them. And you need to make sure that they, that, that, that you enforce that respect. Sure. And if you do that from the very beginning, you'll be, you'll be good, but definitely there is a need of, you know, tropicalization. I'm sure you heard of the success that the, the Popeye sandwich had in the U S right. And sure. We had that the Popeye craze. sandwich. Yeah, we have that Popeye sandwich decades before it was launched in the U.S. Because in international, that was a, a must. I knew about the sandwich and all the versions we had all around the world, right? Um, you know, and so there are certain things that you go, and then you also need to also be clear what it is that you're not going to accept. If you are a chicken place, you're not going to accept the pizza menu item, mm -hmm. you know? And so these are the types of things that you have to be very careful about. Something else is collecting royalties is a big challenge in international. And again, it goes back to who you're going to select and how you're going to do through, go through that process on how you're going to collect the royalties. And if they don't pay, then what do you do? I mean, I found myself when I was in charge of Central America and the Caribbean becoming a collector, you know, and oh. I was able to do, you know, collect a significant amount of money, you know, but you have to build relationships. That's another thing. You know, it's not not just the hammer, but in international, it really is about relationships. It really is about being able to understand the different cultures. I have clothing in my closet. Some of the clothing was for the Middle East. Some of it was for South America, you know, and, you know, you have to be able to understand and respect all of that. And so you if you're going to go in international, you really need to educate yourself with the culture of the people and and how to build the relationships and how different it is and the level of respect in one place, you won't shake hands in another place. People are going to kiss you on the cheek twice, you know, <laughs> right. and you need to be okay with that. Like, you know, so it's just, um, it's a lot of new and sense. I mean, the world of international is amazing. You know, I mentioned I lived in 14 countries. I mm -hmm. oversaw 26 and, um, I love it. It's, it's, it's amazing, but you do need to be able to understand it you know, respect it, know how to work around it. And 
it's all about building relationships with your franchisees. And if you do that, <laughs> then you can be successful and do, you know, and grow really well. Because a lot of times the people that do get those franchises are people with a lot of influence and money in those countries mm -hmm. and you can grow fast there. You just need to make sure that it's with the right person because you can also lose fast control there too. <laughs> True. I, I mm -hmm. think you've uh, heeded a great warning to founders. I, I, you know, just think about domestically founders. If you hear the following line, um, from franchisees, well, you don't understand it's different in my area. <laughs> if you think you hear that in the US and you cringe and it drives you crazy, you ain't seen nothing yet if you decide to go internationally because that one is really different in my area. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I, I cannot even tell you all the things that I've seen right. happening outside of the country. Yes. Yeah, um, let's, let's kind of tie things up here um, with our franchisee relationships because that's really what this is all about. You're really the connector connector Aisha in the franchisee franchise or relationship since you're the one training these franchisees yet oftentimes your client right is the franchise or share with me what are some of the best practices for maintaining a really positive relationship between the franchise or franchisee like who's doing it right and what are they doing you know I would say as soon as you possibly can build at least an advisory group in your in your franchise uh, your franchisees need to feel that they are involved and they are heard, you know, and you cannot imagine the amazing ideas that can come from your franchisees. Right. I was part of the uh, group that, you know, that had a relationship with the advisory boards at Domino's and also at Popeye's and the collaboration we had was amazing. Obviously, also make sure that they're clear that we're hearing you, we're getting your information, but we will be making the decision, uh, you know, and as long as they know that you, you know, that you're doing the decision and why you're doing the decision, because sometimes brands, you know, make decisions, but in, there's always a reason why. I've been in the corporate walls and uh -huh. rooms when the decisions are made that are unpopular for franchisees, but if you explain the why, you know, behind that. Uh, it, it just really goes a long way, not just because I said so, but there's the why. And and I'm hoping that if the franchisors are doing it right, you know, there's a reason that it's going to protect the brand sure. or protect the business or protect the franchisees in economics. You know, there's a, always a reason why. Now, if, there, if the reason why is none of those, um, well, then, of course, that's why franchises will be, un, you know, unhappy, you know, a.k.a. Quiznos. And so, <laughs> you know, so you had to, you know, you had to think about about that. Right. And so um, I think that having a franchisee advisory board early on and depending on what your strengths or your strategic projects are, I could see it on product development. I could see it in customer service. Technology is a big one right now. Yeah. Everybody should have a technology advisory board because you have franchisees that are high tech. Sure. And if you're not, you, you, you know, you can learn from from them. So that will be the first one. Um, number two, as soon as you can, start doing annual meetings minimum uh, where you invite your franchisees to come and, and uh, share a room in afternoon and evening through several days, if, depending on your size, and connect with them, get, inform them, share information, talk about the future, what's coming, get people excited, you know, build culture, uh, build networks between the franchisees, you know, all of that I think is, is going to be very, very important uh, for emerging franchisors. And, uh, have a very good, obviously, you know, this goes without saying, probably the ops manual. I mean, have a very good ops manual. Uh, you know, they need to know, even if, even, even if it's all online, please be as detailed as possible on what you expect. <clears throat> As True. detailed as possible, because sometimes, you know, franchisors are not happy with how franchisees are doing something, but there's no actual clear guidance on some of the things. And some franchises, by the way, if you have your your ops manual on, online, some franchises don't even know where it is. Like literally I have gotten Zoom calls with some of my clients and I say, OK, let's go in your let's go in your in your totally. brand website. OK, click here, click there, click there. Oh, oh look, there it is. You know, and they're not going to, and this is the thing, they're not going to ask you, Mr. Franchisor or Mrs. Franchisor, because they don't want to look bad in front of you. Right. They're not going to tell you the same way that when they're in financial problems, they're not going to tell you because they don't want to f look bad in front of you. So how do you have your FBC, your franchise business consultant, whoever presents a brand and supports the franchisees, 
build that relationship of trust and and safe space so that they can truly share where they add and what need what help they need yeah yeah that fbc position is such a critical one frank yeah you know and how they build relationship with the franchisees is so important you know and the franchise are not going to tell you if you don't create that culture, you don't create those relationships. And by the time you find out, you're closing and you will be surprised because you did not know, especially if you're not collecting P&Ls, right? Right, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, franchisees, are gonna, they're going to make up as they go if as the franchisor you're not providing it for them. One of the things I highly recommend to franchisors is not just have that operations manual and say, here, it's in a binder. When you have a problem, you don't go looking for a binder. You want an answer. So number one, you're probably going to email or call your franchise business coach and get the answer. But if you want to take a step further, integrate your operations manual into, say, your franchisee portal where the problem might happen. So within marketing, in the marketing area where they're doing marketing templates is where you're actually having the support. Right where the problem lies, you want to have the answers. Not in some Absolutely. binder that's going to sit on a credenza. Nobody's going to read that. And then, right. you know, then a franchisor was like, well, it's in the ops manual. That's useless. You know, you wouldn't use that yourself if you had a problem. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. When I was uh, working for Domino's Pizza for the COO at the time, uh, he came from Mrs. Fields Cookies when he took over the, the position. I was there to help the interim and then I stayed with, with the new COO. And when we did tour, tours around the country, you know, he, he would say, what's the answer for this? And what's the answer for that? And I would tell him because I knew the standard manuals from walk, for, forwards and backwards. And he then said, we need job aids. And I want the job aids to be where you use them. And the yes. answer must always be in the wall. Uh, he would say the answer must be in the wall, meaning any question any employee has about anything should be within a hand's reach. So either was a poster in the wall where the action is happening or it right. was a, a, um, a one of those rings with laminated job base hanging right by the station where it was needed. And that was the work that we did for two years uh, <laughs> for, for Pat. And really taught me a lot because if employees really appreciated being able to just hang, you know, reach out and hang in. Now, back then, we did not have the technology we have right now. And so if we have screens everywhere to share with the employees. Why not in that screen, in that technology, provide those quick, easy job aids, right? And so, absolutely. All that that a franchisor can provide the franchisees for easy training, easy reference, and protecting your brand, absolutely, you should do that. Sweet. Aisha, this has been a great conversation. I can go on and on. I got more questions, but we're we're over an hour already in, and I, I want to be respectful of your time. So uh, a couple of things I want to ask. Number one, if somebody was interested in connecting with you and finding about more about the American Franchise Academy, where do they go? Yeah, so just going to visit our, our website, AmericanFranchiseAcademy.com, and there will be many ways in which you can reach out to us, make an appointment with our missions. You can make a note if you want to speak with me directly. I'll be more than happy to just put it in the notes when you make the appointment. And we are, by the way, if you just want to hear us, we have a YouTube channel too where we do all of our tips and best practices for franchisees. Sweet. You can hear what we talk about and what we say about, you know, all the guidance that we provide. And obviously we have information webinars. So if you go to our events page in our website, you can can register to any of our free webinars where we talk about our programs and uh, and how we can support your franchisees. So our clients are our franchisees. Uh, franchisors don't pay for our services. This is a franchisee specific investment uh, for their business. Mm -hmm. And but franchisors, if you like to make an introduction and uh, to your people uh, or have us do a workshop or if you have a conference where you would like to come have me come and speak. Uh, I'll do all those things. So just reach out to us uh, through the website. That's awesome. I'll be sure to check it out myself. I think that's great. Last thing I try, I finish every podcast with what I call the franchise tip jar because as you know, the franchise community is so generous and you have been so generous with sharing so many great tips here. But uh, let's see if you got one more in you. So if I was an entrepreneur and I was going to franchise my concept before I franchise, is there a piece of advice that you'd give me? Uh, yes, define your why. Why do you want to franchise? Because, you know, a lot of people have reached out to me that are thinking about becoming a franchisor. And a lot of the time, my, my mission is to talk you out of it. <laughs> so you know. and, and I just share with you what it really truly means to be a franchisor. And 
people think that they're going to be build a legacy fast in the organization and it isn't you know this is going to be a, a a labor of love that will take years if not decades to get to where you envision you're going to be fast and so first of all what's your why if your why is because you have a brand that you love and you want to spread it in the world and have more people have access to it and uh, be able to to make that happen then that this is a great way if you if you want to be able to make money cash fast this is not the way and if you do it because you know that through your business model you can create opportunities for people to be able to go from a team member to a manager to a franchisee and your goal is to change lives amazing you know if maybe the product service that you provide will change lives and that's what you're passionate about yes that's amazing just make sure that you understand the business management side and the money and the numbers behind it uh there's a many you know so if you know the why then then you will be able to make the decisions behind it to be able to achieve that why Either way, it has to be profitable and sustainable, and that will take time and work. So educate yourself before you take the next step. Be prepared to be a 20 year overnight success. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Aisha, this was great. I, I'm so glad we met. And uh, this was one of my favorite episodes. I've got to tell you that uh, I, I think that you provided oh, so you. much great value. Um, and I want to thank you for being on today's show. Thank you, Frank. I, I, I appreciate it. And thank you for giving me the space to share my message. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host, Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.